Last week we were looking at ethical acts, particularly utilitarianism and Kantian ethics. This week we move to looking at the people involved in those acts. So we look at uh, ethics from the perspective of virtue ethics, uh, and we're also going to look at Kohlberg's theory of moral development. So why don't we look at the objectives that we've got for this week. So as I was saying, what we're going to look at it is at virtue ethics and contrast it to uh, our Kantian and utilitarian approaches to ethics. We're going to look at Kohlberg's uh, theory of moral development uh, and how it applies to the agent. And then we're going to do some application into some uh, business cases, business contexts. So we've been looking at morality and ethics uh, from either a consequences uh, perspective, we did utilitarianism and a little bit of egoism thinking about that, or in terms of a course of action, whether it can be done according to rational principles or a duty. And we looked at Kant's approach when we did that. So both of those have positives and negatives um, as to uh, what they provide us in terms of an ethical analysis. And neither of them give us this kind of foolproof way to approach an ethical dilemma. So now we're going to move into looking at it a different way with virtue ethics. So virtue ethics um, doesn't focus on the action but, in, or, or, but instead focuses uh, on the agent. So it doesn't focus on what we do, but on who is doing it and whether that person, is that person ethical, okay? So that requires us to think about three things. And we can think about this in the first person. Um, as a human being, what's a good life for me? What is a good life for a person? What person should I want to become if I'm going to have a good life? And how do I achieve this? They're really central questions to life and our overall happiness and our purpose in life. Virtue ethics goes back a long way to Plato and Aristotle and the, and the ancient Greeks. And we're going to go back to the beginning to Aristotle and we're going to think about his particular approach um, to virtue ethics. So his particular approach required four key things. The first thing was to recognize that uh, everything in life has an objective or a purpose or a goal. Okay, so that's the function of that thing. That thing then, when it has the attributes of whatever that thing should be, whether it can to meet those objectives, um, if it can have the good attributes to meet the objectives of that thing, it can flourish. Okay. So to work out what you need to do to flourish, to really exceed and have a great life, we need to work out what those attributes are. And he calls them virtues. And then finally, he starts thinking about, well, how can we develop these virtues if we want to develop a great life? Okay, let's go into a little bit more detail. Let's start off at the base of functions, goals, and the good. So Aristotle looked at humans and at nature, and he said, look, everything in life has a function or a purpose, right? And if it can do that thing well or achieve its goal well, it will have certain virtues or excellences, right? So a knife has a function or a goal or a purpose to cut. So a knife is there to cut. Then you can say, well, what are the attributes of a good knife? Well, if a good knife is meant to cut, then a knife will be sharp, a knife will be uh, strong, um, a uh, knife will fit well in the hand, etc. So we can talk about excellences or virtues. And the example we have written here is a golf club, right? A golf club is there to hit golf balls. If it's going to do that well, it's got a good size, weight, balance and material. But it was not just about things. Right? Aristotle said people, and even roles, can have these excellences. So there are virtues to being a good student, a good manager, a good accountant, a good marketer. And you can think about for a minute, you know, what are the attributes or the excellences of a really great student? So once we work out what this actual function is, then the next thing is to step back and say, well, what are the virtues or excellences associated with being a good human? So what is our goal so that we can step back uh, in order to work out what these attributes are? And he looked at a number of things and what was playing particularly on his mind is this idea of what distinguishes, right? What distinguishes humans from everything else, 
And his key idea here was that reason or rationality or our ability to think really separates us from most uh, other aspects of the natural world. As a result, if it wasn't this distinctiveness, right, that distinctiveness must have something to do with our function or our goals um, uh, as we've been discussing. So therefore, when he looked at something to say, okay, should our goal be pleasure? And he'd say, well, look, all other animals can pursue pleasure too. So there's nothing really distinctive about that as a human. So that's really not um, part of our, that, that really shouldn't be part of our overall flourishing. In much the same way, he looked at wealth and honor and uh, prestige and said, well, you know, that, that's a little bit better. That's not just pure pleasure, but really you're doing that to get something else. And, and not only that, other animals have hierarchies, for instance, in them. Primates have hierarchies, wolf packs have hierarchies, etc. Um, the whole idea of an alpha male is not just applied to the human species. So he's saying, well, that's not really unique about humans either. Instead, what he said was actually, you know, it's about using our rationality and using it in a certain way. That's what leads to us flourishing. It's about pursuing the virtues themselves. And because we have reason, he identified a number of intellectual virtues, knowledge, craftsmanship, wisdom. But he also had a number of character-based uh, or moral virtues, such as courage, justice, self-mastery, generosity. And what's really important to understand here is Aristotle is saying we're not pursuing these virtues um, to, in order to achieve some goal like pleasure or prestige. We actually flourish or we, we are happier and we do have a better life just by pursuing the virtues in and of themselves. And that was our function. So that's the whole idea here going on behind why we pursue these virtues. That's what it will give us this life of flourishing. Now, in terms of giving us some rules around what is flourishing and, and uh, oh, sorry, how do we determine how to act in terms of these virtues, he didn't come down with any kind of set of rules or calculations. Instead, he came up with this, with this idea of the golden mean. Okay? So the basic idea is that you can think about a virtue as being in the middle of two ends of a continuum. Right? And at either end of the continuum is a vice. So let's just take one of the easier ones, courage. So courage is a virtue. We want to be courageous. At one end of the continuum is cowardice, the lack of courage. At the other end of the continuum is rashness, too much of the courage. So the idea here is that we want to be in the middle, right? not an excess, not an excess, not a deficiency. That is how we know that we're acting in accordance with a virtue. And you can see here a number of these uh, particular virtues set out uh, along with the deficiencies at either end, the deficiency or the excess, and they all relate to an area of life. It is worth noting also that there was one virtue, justice, which he didn't see as a continuum, but rather as a polar opposite to the idea of acquisitiveness uh, and greed. But in general, it's this idea that we're aiming for what he would term the golden mean. Now, one of the hard things about Aristotle's approach is he really said that there's no way to know when you're, at, when you're at the mean. In fact, what he said you really need is practical wisdom. So when you're faced with a particular problem, how do you know what to do? How do you know that you're actually being courageous and not rash? And he said, well, here's a couple of rules. First, if you think that one extreme is going to be worse than the other, aim for the least worst. So go a bit more towards the pole that seems least worst. So I think if you're going into battle, right, lean more towards rashness rather than cowardice, right? Because that's probably going to be better than being a, a, a cowardice in that situation. Then number two, think about yourself. So if we're going into battle and I'm a timid, shy person and I tend to be a little bit of afraid, I need to go even more towards the rashness to balance out that tendency. So you've really got to know yourself as well to be able to be making these, uh, these kind of uh, adjustments. And then third, be careful 
about pleasure and pain, right? Because they might push you to the opposite extreme of what you should be doing. So there are some tips about how to think about the problem in his approach. And in order to work out the right thing, we, we need this practical wisdom, this rationality, using some of the intellectual virtues to help us work out what is the right thing to do. Uh, essentially, the virtuous person uses their practical wisdom to put the virtues into action. And that means they carry out an action at the right time, with the right motive, in the right way for the right person. It's a very contextual, uh, individual-based approach to, to ethics. So how do we actually develop uh, these virtues? Well, he saw a bit of a different way. In terms of the intellectual virtues, they can be trained and developed. In terms of the character approach, though, they were more habits that had to be practiced and learned. So we see two quite different approaches, and we also see this approach to a lifelong pursuit and development of the individual in leading the virtuous life. What becomes really important in their development is our social environment. So uh, our family, friends, school, any religion that we've been exposed to. Why? Because these things, in one sense, they uh, allow us to be trained in the intellectual way, but they also help us develop habits and importantly give us role models and mentors as to what a virtuous life is. So often when we think about a particular problem from a virtue ethics perspective, we can focus on asking, you know, what would my role model or mentor do? Notice here that this is focusing on what an agent, what a virtuous agent would do, not what the actual act is. Most other aspects of ethics, there are positives and negatives to the approach. Okay, so overall, this is a much broader framework, looking at the whole person as they develop, not on some specific individual decision that we need to make as to whether it's ethical or not. It also brings into, uh, into the frame the whole person, not just the rational, but also the emotional elements uh, of the person in the decision making. And it accepts context, right? It accepts that there is complexity in different situations and for different people, so that ethics might actually change based upon um, the particular situation that we find ourselves in. Like all other um, theories and, and, and frameworks in ethics, there are criticisms. Does it really give us much guidance? You know, there's a lot of greyness around some of those rules that Aristotle had for us. It doesn't consider those dilemmas where we get conflicts between virtues, such as uh, loyalty conflicting with generosity. And finally, some virtues might not actually be ethical. So we can think of, say, the loyal thief, honour among thieves. That, that's not really a virtuous person at all. Or the example here, a courageous member of the mafia is not really a, uh, a virtuous person. So, there, so it isn't all upside. There's also some criticisms of virtue ethics. But the best way to learn more about virtue ethics, as with any other part of ethics, is to do some application. So uh, hopefully you'll have a go at a case or two.